Welcome back to Globetrotting. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to do so. It's been nearly 20 years since the legendary supersonic airliner, Concord, touched down from its last flight ever, never to take the skies again. With its retirement came the end of an era that began with high hopes and a utopian vision of sleek, futuristic supersonics crossing the skies, connecting the furthest reaches of the Earth in record times. But that ended with a slow and tragic death of the very concept of the supersonic airliner itself. However, since then, aviation technology has greatly advanced, so much so that some believe the supersonic airliner, an idea which may have been born at the wrong time, is finally ready to enter the world once more and this time to stay for good. In order to answer the question of whether or not supersonic airliners will ever return to the skies, we must first understand why we left them in the first place. And to do that, we should examine the origins of the concept itself. The 1960s were a decade of optimism for the future. With the Cold War in full swing, both the capitalist West and the communist East were in a constant race to one-up each other technologically, leading some of the most incredible engineers achievements that the world has ever seen. In the past two decades up to that point, commercial aviation had rapidly advanced from slow, noisy and cramped propeller planes to sleek and high and also fast flying jetliners. Still though, many believed that the envelope could be pushed even further and the obvious next step seemed to be for planes to go even faster. In a similar vein to the space race, the United States, Western Europe and the Soviet Union each wanted to be the first to put a supersonic airliner in the air and boast their technological prowess to the world. The American aircraft manufacturers Boeing and Lockheed as well as the Soviet Tupolev each drew up their own designs for a supersonic airliner. And of course, competing against them was the Concorde as well, a collaboration between the British and French aviation industries. To anyone at the time, it would have seemed like the shift to supersonic was just around the corner. However, as we know, only the Concorde barely survived into the 20th century. The supersonic Tupolev Tu-144 was retired in 1979, and Boeing and Lockheed's proposals never really even left the concept stage. What happened? While many things contributed to the downfall of the supersonic airliner, we can identify at least four major factors. One was the infamous sonic boom. If you didn't already know, objects create a shockwave of noise called a supersonic boom when they break the sound barrier, which doesn't just happen once, but occurs along the entire supersonic flight path. This sound is loud, loud enough to shatter windows and cause hearing damage even when the plane is tens of thousands of feet in the air. The United States government conducted several tests in which they flew supersonic jets over populated areas of their country to test public reactions. Needless to say, a majority of citizens said they simply could not tolerate the noise. What this effectively did was limit supersonic airliners to overseas flying only, greatly reducing their profitability. The second factor was the economics. While Concorde could cut the length of transatlantic crossing in half, the fact that the airliner just used so much fuel meant that the ticket cost would meet or even exceed that of a first class seat on a conventional jetliner. The simple fact was that very few were able to practically afford to use Concorde speed to their own advantage. The poor and middle classes simply couldn't afford the tickets, and even some of the rich preferred to simply pay for a much more comfortable business or first class seat, instead of arriving at their destination just a few hours earlier with Concorde. As a result of this, Concorde's almost never flew at full capacity, further damaging their profitability. The third factor was environmental concerns. Supersonic airliners would fly so high into the atmosphere that their emission of greenhouse gases was predicted to do serious damage to the ozone layer. And finally, the fourth factor was the infamous crash of Air France 4590, in which a Concorde crashed shortly after takeoff due to a ruptured fuel tank, tragically killing all 113 people on board. 
While it is controversial whether or not the crash was the fault of Concorde itself, there is no doubt that it greatly soured the image of the airplane and of supersonic airliners as a whole in the public eye. However, as stated, aviation technology has advanced by leaps and bounds in the two decades since Concorde's final flight. So, could supersonic airliners make a comeback? Let's see how recent concepts address our four main issues outlined. As for the sonic boom, it is NASA who is leading the effort to engineer an aircraft with quieter sonic booms. Specifically, their experimental X-59 aircraft utilises a blunted nose, an hourglass-shaped fuselage, and other design features to reach their goal of quieting the aircraft's sonic boom from 110 decibels to around 75, which they claim will be equivalent to the noise level of thunder during a storm. On the side of economics, Boom Supersonic plans to make their flagship airliner Overture, low in overall capacity at only 60 seats, but as luxurious as a typical business or first class section in a conventional jetliner. By doing this, they won't straddle the line between premium price and standard comfort, like Concorde did, instead targeting only the ultra-wealthy who are willing to pay for a flight that is both fast and luxurious. In addition, modern aircraft technologies have made airliner safety even better, which will hopefully prevent another incident like 4590. Lastly, the environment is still a great concern, as while Boom Supersonic claims that by using sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF, its project will be carbon neutral. These claims have been yet to be proven, and that's largely what has happened with Boom Supersonic so far. There's been a lot of key talking points, a lot of announcements, also a lot of partnerships being signed, but not a lot of movement. From their XB-1 baby boom demonstrator that was meant to take to the skies towards the latter part of the 2010s, to so much more. Nothing of magnitude has happened, and with a first flight that is meant to occur in only a matter of years, and no full-size demonstrator, well, the future is going to be very interesting, and Boom Supersonic, while at the moment seem to be the leading force for the return of supersonic travel, have a lot of questions that need to be answered. Overall, while some factors point to the potential viability of the revival of a supersonic airliner, other factors say that such an idea is still very far from becoming a reality. What do you think? We'd love to hear which side of the spectrum you're on. Do you believe that supersonic air travel will make a comeback? Or are you firmly on the side that believes it simply won't happen, it won't be possible, and we won't see it return? Instead, maybe you're favouring new technology from both Airbus and Boeing that moves away from supersonic jets and to more efficient means of transportation. Like we said, let us know down below in the comments, and thank you very much for tuning into this video. We hope you've been enjoying the content, and there's much more to come. Take care and be safe, and we'll see you in the next few days for more aviation analysis. And flight, and we'll fly.